Welcome to ECE 595, Statistics 598, or Machine Learning 1. Today we are going to talk about lecture number 34 on minimum distance attack, one of the three forms of adversary attacks that we can normally find in the literature today. Before we talk about the technical details, let me give you an overview of what we are going to do in today's lecture and also tomorrow's lecture. Last time, we talked about some basic terminologies of adversarial attack. I introduced you uh, a number of examples in adversarial attack, and I talked about what is the uh, definition of adversarial attack. I also give you a brief introduction of the geometry of adversarial attack. In today's lecture and the next lecture, we're going to look into the specific details of how to attack. Specifically, we are going to look at three forms of adversarial attacks, namely the minimum distance attack, which is the topic that we are going to talk about today. And then we are going to talk about maximum loss attack and also regularized attack in the next lecture. Now, we're going to spend most of time in looking at linear models. The reason of doing this is because we want to know exactly what is the geometry. We want to know if we are able to solve the optimization problem so that we can look into the closed form solutions without worrying about the computational cost. Now, of course, linear models, they are just linear models. They are very, very far from what we are seeing today in the literature. And therefore, we want to bridge from the linear models to the deep neural networks that we are seeing nowadays. And so in both today's lecture and the next lecture, we are going to spend time first talk about linear models, and then we are going to bridge into the deep models. Now, what we ask you in this course is to really understand the linear models. If you do have experience with deep neural networks, then you will probably find that deep neural network discussion is quite interesting in the sense that you will be able to see how these deep neural networks actually got uh, developed from those linear models. Here is today's agenda. We're going to spend time talking about two parts of this lecture. The first part, as I have introduced, that we are going to look at the linear models. We are going to look into the definition of what do we mean by minimum distance attack. We are going to look at the uh, geometry of this attack. And then we will look into the optimization problem and also its optimization solution. Then in the second half of this lecture, we're going to look into uh, deep neural network models. And specifically, we're going to learn about one very, very popular adversarial attack methods. It's called the deep fool method developed back in 2016. Uh, we're going to look into the details of this method, and we want to draw the connection from the deep fool to the minimum distance attack in this framework. And afterwards, we are going to extend the discussion from the typical L2 norm to the L infinity norm as a way to connect to what we are going to talk about in the next lecture about maximum loss attack. So let's start by talking about the minimum distance attack. As I discussed in the last lecture, minimum distance attack, also like the other two attacks, they are all in the form of optimization. Specific to minimum distance attack, the optimization takes the following form. You have a objective function that takes the distance between your optimization variable x and also your current data point x0. So let me remind you that this is your current data point and uh, x is your optimization variable. And therefore, if you are able to minimize this distance, what you are essentially doing is that you want to travel from one 
one class to another class such that x will likely be going to a wrong class whereas x0 is in your original class. Now, when you try to minimize this distance, you really want to say that the, the, the path or the path length that I have traveled is minimized. Now, in order to ensure that your data point is misclassified, you want to have this constraint here. Now, this constraint says that I want my data point x, when I pass it to the discriminant functions, here I have two discriminant functions. One is gt, which is the discriminant function of my target space. And then gj, they are, they are the discriminant functions of all the other classes. And so you want to make sure that when you pass this data point x into your g of t, that will give you the maximum value compared to anyone else in the space. So if you look at this equation, this equation is equivalent to say that my g of t of x is going to be bigger than gj of x uh, for any j that is not the same as my t. Okay, and so here the equation t says that you are looking at your target class, and so the discriminant function when you evaluate at x has to be higher than anyone else in the space where this gj, j will go from one to all the number of classes that you have in the data set. So if you can ensure that this constraint is satisfied, and you can ensure that the distance that you travel is minimized, then you are guaranteed to go into wrong class with the shortest distance. So here's the diagram. Let's say this is your discriminant function, which uh, have the equation of gtx equals to zero. And let's say here is your data point of x zero. And what you're going to do is that you are going to travel from one space to another. Uh, and then you want to go into the other class, but you also want to make sure that your distance is minimized and therefore you will find a point here as your x. Now, can you find an, another point x? Let's say, can you find a point here? Would this be a good x? Uh, this is not a very good x because this is, this is not minimizing the distance. And only this point is minimizing the distance. Now, I also want to emphasize that this distance, I haven't really put down a specific norm. I just say that it is a norm. Now, what we are going to see in the later half of this lecture is that we can replace this norm, uh, usually the two norm by infinity norm. And then in that case, the solution would become different. So let's first talk about the geometry of the attack. So I want to claim that if you're looking into the L2 distance, Okay, I'm looking into the L2 distance. This is one of the very special norm that we are looking at. If you use the L2 distance, then when you solve this minimum distance attack problem, equivalently, what you're doing is that you are doing a projection onto a set. Now, let me describe what is a set. The set is this omega. It is a set that contains all the x such that your constraint is satisfied. So imagine that you have a space that you have multiple classes, okay? And let's say this is your current data point, this is your x0, and then here it will be your class of target C of t. And so uh, the, the decision boundary that you're looking at will be to go from here to here. So that will become your g of t of x equals to zero. Okay, and so now what you want to do is that you are you're first you're looking at here, and then you want to project this point onto the space that is constrained by your set. Okay, so this is your separating hyperplane, and you really want to project this onto the space given by your target class. Now, how can you show that? Well, we can show it by this picture because if this is your input data point, then the closest distance that you can travel, of course, in terms of this L2 space, would be this 
propagation uh, uh, direction. And then the distance that you're going to travel will be this. And you can show that that this will be minimized. And also, uh, you are going to satisfy the constraint that you give to the problem. So in terms of a, um, a nonlinear space, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do something similar. Let's say you are starting with x0, and then you have a nonlinear decision boundary. You're also going to just travel along the closest distance, because we're using an L2 norm, going into the decision boundary. Now, once you go into this direction, then you can show that it is essentially a projection from a data point to the space that is defined by uh, the service. When you try to launch an attack, normally you would just want to say that here is my data point x0. I want to go to the closest point on the decision boundary, and I call it x. Now, if you do it in this way, then you can see that x is really defined as the projection onto the set omega, where right here is your omega, and then you have x0. Now, in many, many cases, you can actually go further than just going on to the decision boundary. Let's say you really, really want to travel uh, farther away along the same perturbation angle. And so what you can do is that you can say that my x can be defined as x0 plus any kind of perturbation defined by this n angle. And this angle says that I'm going to look into this p, o, p omega of x0 minus x0. So that would be your perturbation angle. And then you multiply a step size of alpha. And so now you are starting with x0 and you travel along this direction with a step size of alpha, then you will go into the other space. Now, uh, the problem of doing this is that, of course, you need to find a very, very good alpha such that you can go into the space, but not overshooting. If you do choose a very, very big alpha, then you can land on one of the, these two cases. The first case says that you're starting with x0, and then you overshoot across your target class. This is your target class. But you go across your target class, going back to your, your, your original class. Now, how can we come up with this decision boundary? That can be possible, even if you think about a Gaussian uh, discriminant function where you have a quadratic uh, classifier. So this can actually happen. The other possibility is that uh, you are going from one class, and then here is your target class, but you overshoot, and therefore you go across to here. Okay, and therefore you will land on to a completely different task, which is not a, a your uh, your original target class. Now, let me also talk about there are different forms of adversarial attacks. The first form of adversarial attack is called the target attack. The target attack says that I am starting at CI, which is my current class, and I want to go into my target class. So I, I am specifically looking into my cl target class C of T. This is quite different than if I am at class C of I, I just want to perturb the, the data point, not class CI. So in this example, you can see that if I'm doing the uh, in target attack, you can think of, I have a panda image. However, I really, really want to turn the panda to become a given. And in that case, you have a target class. And so you want to move the input class to the target class. In this case, uh, in the untargeted case, what you have is that you still have a panda image, but you do not care whether it becomes a given or not. You just want it to be not panda. And therefore, what you want to do is to just go away from your current class. The formulation of the targeted and the untargeted class uh, is very similar. The difference has to go with the constraint. In the targeted attack setting, the constraint set omega is defined by the equation that we have seen before, which says that your targeted class 
has a discriminant function evaluated as uh, x bigger than anyone else in the classes that you're considering. The untargeted attack says that you have your current class, this is a g of i, and then it has to be less than anyone, even the weakest one in the classes that you're considering. So if you want to look into this equation, you can rewrite it as g of i of x has to be less than g of j of x uh, for any i that is not the same as j. Okay, so what this equation says is that here is your, is your, is your current class, this is your input class, and then you are evaluating anyone else and these and these guys they have to be bigger than you so that when you when when you put the data point x into it it has the smallest value when you are in your current class if that happens then of course your decision will say that uh, the the x would belong to one of the j's now to ensure this is correct you want to make sure that this j is evaluated over all the possible classes that you are considering and therefore this is called the untargeted attack now, uh, for, the, for the target attack, you can show that normally this problem, if you're looking into a, a, a linear case, uh, this is usually a, a convex problem. So let's say here is your uh, uh, decision space, and this is your data point of x, x0. And because you want to go into the class C of T, and also because uh, all the decision boundaries, they are linear in this particular example, uh, then you can show that going from X0 to XT, you're really having a constraint set given by this class C of T, and it is convex. However, if you try to look into this uh, 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 untargeted attack problem, then the problem becomes non-convex because anyone else that is not you will be considered as the constraint set. And so clearly you can see that there's a non-convexity going on in the uh, untargeted attack setting. There is also a difference between the notion of white box attack and black box attack. White box attack says that I know everything about the classifier. In other words, I know all the discriminant functions GI. In the deep network setting, it means that I know all the network parameters and also the architectures. And if this happens, then uh, what you will have is this constraint set, which is the constraint set that we have been looking at so far. There is another form of attack, it's called the black box attack. In the black box attack, what you will have is that you cannot know exactly what the GIs are. However, you will be able to probe into the GIs uh, for specific samples. In other words, if you give me x1, x2, so xm, these are the instance that you can, you can send to the classifier. The classifier can give you a response of telling you what is the value, uh, this, the discriminant value when you apply GI on the data point xi. So in the deep neural network setting, it would be that I have this deep neural network, but I don't know is, uh, is network architecture in is uh, model parameters. However, I can keep sending the image through the deep neural network and get the response from the deep neural network. This is called the uh, black box attack. Now, at this point, you may think that black box attack means that I know nothing about the deep neural network at all. If you really do not know anything about the classifier at all, then this problem is not that solvable. Basically, what you're doing is that you just want to protect the data point from, from, from the current observation to something else. And this is not really attack, it's just adding noise. And so in order to attack any classifier, you do need to provide certain knowledge about the classifier. The minimum knowledge that you need to provide is that you have to allow the hacker to probe into your classifier to get some information, at least uh, what will be the response when you send the image into that classifier. Okay, so we have talked about a lot of basic terminologies. 
And what I'm going to do is to give you a basic principle of how to attack a classifier. The, the, there are three principles. Uh, these three principles will be applied to all the three different forms of attacks. The first principle is that we have to solve an optimization problem. Uh, now, when you look at the, the, the paper, uh, you, you will realize that a lot of these papers, they will say that, hey, this is my uh, input data, and then this is uh, my gradient, and as long as I travel along this gradient, then I will be able to fool the classifier. Now, what is not discussed in all these paper is that beyond these gradients, uh, you actually have an optim underlying optimization problem. And therefore, uh, unless you, will, you really know what optimization problem you are solving, you pretty much do not have a way to tell what would be the optimum direction to attack. As such, we do really need to formulate the optimization problem, and I claim that any adversary attack has to come from solving an optimization problem. The second principle is that if you look at this optimization problem, you will see that there is an inequality. However, what I will want to show is that this inequality is not necessary. You just need to, is to solve the problem using an equality. Now, why is that true? It's because that when you have a decision boundary, when you take a point here, all you need to do is to find the right traveling direction and then just to hit the decision boundary. Once you hit the decision boundary, you put a very, very small epsilon. Now, that epsilon doesn't need to be big. It can be extremely small. As long as you have a small epsilon that can, uh, that can go away from the decision boundary, then you can find a point that is sitting right next to the decision boundary and it goes into the wrong class. The third principle is that your attack angle, if you solve the optimization problem, it will be optimal. However, the attack angle does not always need to be optimal. Now, what do I mean by optimum? Optimum really depends on the, the norm that I'm using. If I'm trying to minimize the two norm and I call minimum two norm as my optimum point, then the two norm will be optimum. If I, if I claim the two norm to be optimum, but I'm using an L infinity norm, then of course the L infinity norm solution is not optimum in the sense of the L2 distance. However, optimum search direction only means that you have the most worst uh, attack. Uh, so what I mean is that uh, in this diagram, you can attack in this direction. This is the minimum L2 distance attack. You can also attack the classifier by traveling along this direction. Now, is it a good attack? No, it's, a very, it's not a very, very good attack. However, it's still a, a valid attack. The price you need to pay is that you need to travel a little bit uh, farther away from the origin. So by being optimal, you can, will launch the nastiest attack However, you can still fool the classifier using a, a less nasty attack. So these are the three principles of launching attack. You can see that we are going to solve an optimization problem. That is principle number one. You will also see that we are going to just solve the equality optimization problem. And three, you can see that we are going to replace the norm by different types of norms and we are still able to attack the classifier. So our plan next is to talk about linear classifiers, and we are going to talk about binary classifiers, where you only have two cases. Now, this is very, very unreal in the sense that how often that you need to use a linear classifier for just two cases. Uh, however, we do want to uh, look into this problem because this is a very nice toy problem which allows us to derive closed form expressions and get good solutions, and we can draw the geometry. So let's just go into a little bit details about this uh, two class, binary classifier, linear classifiers. The, if you restrict yourself 
um, to the L2 norm, and also you restrict yourself to linear in two class problems, then by linearity, you can show that the discriminant function can be simplified into this equation. Now, why is that? Because each uh, g of t is a discriminant uh, function. It has to be written as w transpose uh, x plus w uh, zero. This is a linear form of the discriminant function. This applies to any kinds of linear classifiers, including linear regression, logistic regression, support vector machines, and anything that we have discussed in part two of our course. The second problem is to use to, re to relax the problem to a two class uh, situation where you do not have multiple classes, but only two classes. If you only have two classes, then certainly one would be your input class, the other one has to be your target class. Now, once you have the input class and the target class only, then you can relax the, the constraint to just have two cases. The first one would be the GIs, the other one would be the GT. You will not need to handle the max operation anymore because there's only one class, which is the input class. If you put everything down, then you can show that the optimization problem is simplified to this very, very, very familiar problem, which says that I want to minimize the two norm distance between my current point x0 and my optimization variable x with a constraint that my x has to satisfy this linear equation. So what is this problem? This problem is nothing, but trying to find the distance from a point to a plane, something that we have talked about multiple times in this course. Uh, so what is the solution? I'm not going to repeat the solution, which you can go back a few lectures, back to uh, part two and also part one of our semester, and then you'll be able to find the derivation of the solution. What we are going to show is that this solution is, is it will be x, and it can be written as x zero minus a perturbation distance. And this, this perturbation is given by w, that would be your search direction. Now recall that if you have a separating hyperplane, then the w is really the normal vector that points out from the plane. How about this value? Uh, this value is the distance that it has to travel from your point uh, x0 to your uh, 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 your plane, okay? So this will be your traveling distance of w transpose x0 divided by the two norm of uh, uh, w. So this is a very simple geometry. And once you put the simple geometry into the problem, you can see that the minimum L2 norm attack for a two-class linear classifier takes an extremely simple form as follows. You have uh, the solution being x star. It has to be uh, x0 minus this perturbation angle, uh, w time, uh, w divided by the two norm of w. And then you have uh, the, uh, the, the traveling distance. Okay, so at this point, we know everything about the minimum distance attack for a extremely simple case that we know that if you have a linear classifier, if you have a data point, all you need to do is just to travel along the normal direction of your separating hyperplane, and then the distance that you travel will just be the distance that you, how far you are away from your point to the plane. That describes all the geometry, that describes you the solution, uh, which is in this particular form, and uh, that tells you everything you need to know about the minimum distance attack. Nothing magical, nothing dark, it's very transparent, and this is adversary attack. If you have a two-class linear classifier, no matter if you're using support vector machine, logistic regression, linear regression, or a simple perceptron algorithm, uh, the attack will be launched in this form. It's a white box attack 
because we do assume that we know the Ws. So here is a diagram that summarizes what we have talked uh, before. I want to emphasize that the L2 norm that we're using in the optimization will draw you a lot of concentric circles around the point X0. So what you're doing is that you're drawing this uh, concentric circles, you make them bigger and bigger until the moment that you hit the decision boundary. And then this hitting point uh, will be your, uh, uh, your attack point. And certainly, you can just move along this W angle a little bit uh, with a delta, then you can guarantee that you will run into the target class. All right. So we have talked about everything about the linear model, and we know about the geometry, and we know about the optimization problem, we know about the optimization solution. That's very clear now. However, we still have a question of how are we going to link from this linear model to the deep neural networks that we are seeing in the literature nowadays. So in the second part of this lecture, what I'm going to do is to talk about the bridge from linear models to deep neural networks.